Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Deborah and I are going to team teach today. So I'm going to get right into a prayer. If you're here for the first time, we don't want you to leave. We want you just to meet us right after church service at the right-hand side of the foyer. Now hear me now. If you're here for the first time, we usually greet people, but because we're on a tight time schedule today, we want to make sure, we want to greet you, tell you we love you, thanks for coming if you're here for the first time. But instead of running off, what we want you to do is go to the right-hand side of the foyer after church service. All the pastors will be there. We'll meet you. Coffee, tea, cookies, donuts, hot chocolate waiting for you. Get to know each other a little bit. We'd like to meet you. So come on, meet us over there if you're here for the first time. Let's pray. Father, just stay seated. Father, we just come to you today. Mm, Lord, hallelujah. That we get to come, get to come, get to, get to, get to come into the house of God. We don't have to come, we get to come. What a privilege, Lord. There's about 12% of the population of this country that's truly in love with you. There's over 50% say they want nothing to do with you, don't even want to talk about you, don't even think about you, don't even care about you. And that's fine, God. That's their call. That's their choice. But us 12%, wherever we are, we have come into the house of God to worship you and praise you today. Give you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. Be glorified in your houses everywhere. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. The great big shout we say, amen. <laughs> Mama. Merry Christmas. My name is Deborah Cobray, and I'm Jim's wife. And um, I remember our first Christmas 23 years ago here. We were at the Econo Lodge, and there was 36 of us there. It was a Sunday. It was our very first year, and we'd only been going about six months. And I remember counting the seats, and there was 36 people. And there's more than that here today. God's done an amazing thing. And, you know, even with America, Jim just said that there's only 12%. But I know that through the eyes of God, he has a great plan for this nation. He's not done with us yet. Amen? There's hope. There's great hope in this message. And this morning, part two of, we, we did part one last week, lessons from parents. And it was actually Mary and Joseph. And this week, it's lessons from the nativity. And the word nativity is just another word for birth. Lessons from his birth. And, and we've had a lot of Christmas here. I love Christmas. It's my favorite time of the year because it's the time for me where I step back and stand in awe and amazement that as Jim said, the king of the universe and the father of eternities would slip out of the glory that attended him, his de not his deity, but just all that went with it and became a man for you and I so that he could be the lamb of God. It's an amazing thing, and there's lessons. And here's the deal, guys. I could read you this Christmas story, and it could be another Christmas service, and we could have a history lesson. But God's word is sharp and powerful. And God's word is alive. And I don't know about you, but I need God to speak to me in the 21st century. 2,000 years ago this happened, but I'm living in the 21st century. I'm 61. I got 11 grandkids and four kids. I've lived a long time. I've done a lot of Christmas services. But in the 21st century, right now today, I need to hear from God. I need to know how to live my life. And this is God's word speaking to me through this word. It's alive and it's sharp and it's powerful. And God says, no word of mine is void of power. But it will accomplish that which I purpose it to do. And God said, as the sky is high and as the heavens are high above the earth, as the rain comes down and waters the earth and does not return, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall accomplish that which I've sent it to do. And God has a message and a word today for you and I. But it can be a religious service or it can be a time when you hear from God. Luke chapter 2, Christmas story, lessons from the nativity. Verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That since this first took place, while well, Quirinius was governing Syria. Luke lays this out very succinctly because he wants to give us the history of this nativity, what was happening. And what was happening was that there was a Caesar in place, Caesar Augustus. Rome was in power. 
the cruel and oppressive, unbelievable regime that Daniel saw in his vision of his legs of iron that crushed out all life and overwhelmed everything in Israel was under the oppression of Rome. And Caesar decides that he needs more taxes, so he decides to take a census of all of his arena and all of his area. And that meant that he had to move people back to where they were born because that's where the records were kept. And that's why Luke is laying this down. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I've heard this story a million times. We've read it. Today, lessons from the nativity, point one, lesson number one is trouble is God's stage for signs, wonders, and miracles. Trouble is God's stage. His platform, his billboard, how he speaks and how he arranges the supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles into the earth's realm is trouble. In other words... Trouble's going to find you and I. Jesus said in John 16, in the world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have pressure. You're going to have stress. You're going to think you're squeezed until you can't be squeezed anymore. You're going to be pressed down until you think you can't be pressed down anymore. There's going to be more trouble coming at you than you know what to do. He said, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And how you and I handle trouble is going to determine whether or not we're a stage and a platform for God's signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, how did I get that out of this? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about it. Lessons from the nativity. I'm on some medication, so if you wonder why I'm drinking so much, it's because my mouth is dry. But I'm healed in the name of Jesus Christ, and by his stripes, I'm healed. You have no idea what I'm talking about, and you don't need to know, but there's healing in Jesus. And I'm up here today healed, as is my husband. Because trouble's going to find us. But how we handle trouble is going to determine whether or not we see signs. Fact. That God said in Isaiah chapter 7, and we've read this before, but let me just quickly read it to you again. Isaiah 7, 14, up on the screen, please. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Trouble is God's platform, God's stage for signs. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, will give you a message, will show you something that's never been done before and never been seen before. We'll give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Mary had to be a virgin to conceive this child for a sign, and yet Mary had to lose her reputation for the rest of her life because of it. Trouble found her because of the sign. Let's go on. How about the fact that they had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Wait a minute, God. I've been pregnant. How many girls in here have had babies? In your ninth month, you don't want to go anywhere. You're as stretched as far as you can be stretched, and you want to lay down and have this baby, and you don't care how. You just want it now. Bethlehem is 80 miles from Nazareth. Now, there is not a record here of a donkey or a mule. Now, maybe there was because that's what we see in the traditions. There is no record here. I can't find a donkey in there. So that means they did have to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem somehow, probably on foot, 80 miles. Now, if you travel 20 miles a day, that's four days of travel, nine months pregnant. That wasn't comfortable. But you see, God's not interested in my comfort. He is interested in me. And he will allow me to go through the trouble. He didn't send it, but he will allow it because the trouble is going to be a very stage and platform for his purposes and his plans. Now, I don't want the trouble. I'm sure if they would have had their wish list, Mary would have said to God, do we have to go 80 miles, me in my ninth month? Do I have to have this child in a lambing cave? Do I have to have this child like this? But you see, it was to be a sign, and it was to be a wonder, and it was to be a miracle. And we're going to see that in a minute. Trouble is God's stage for signs, wonders, and miracles. So God had to move a Caesar to move a world to move a nation, to move a couple from Nazareth 
to Bethlehem because in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he had to fulfill a prophecy. There was a sign that had to be fulfilled from the mouth of his prophet. You see, all God's word is active. All God's word is programmed to come to pass. And Micah prophesied it over 700 years before the Messiah was ever born. Can I have it up? Therefore, but you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among all the thousands of Judah, out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. That prophecy had to be fulfilled. God moved a Caesar to move a world, to move a nation, to move a couple from Nazareth to Bethlehem for a sign, wonder, and a miracle. Trouble God uses in his purposes. He doesn't send them, but he will use the trouble for a platform and a stage. Now let's go to the last one. Lessons from the nativity. Trouble is God's stage for miracles. Well, we see the virgin was a sign. We see their prophecy had to be fu fulfilled. They had to travel. And now we're going to look at something in verse number 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks. By night... And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. And this will be a sign to you. God, does my baby have to be born in a lambing cave? Does my baby have to have its first bed in a trough? But this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That manger was a sign from heaven to reveal the Messiah. Now, it's an interesting thing if you think about how the kingdom of heaven and God, the maker of all eternity, the father of eternities, how he decided to slip into earth, into a small, unimportant little town that nobody had ever heard of, except Micah and the prophets. He had this child born in a stable, possibly and probably a lambing cave. We've been Bethlehem, Jim and I, and you step down into a cave. And this child's first breath was drawn with the stench of creation, and his last breath was drawn on a cross, smelling his own blood. The maker of eternity. You see, God is saying something all the time, and this word speaks continually. And God is saying that his strength and his power and his greatness isn't seen like we see it. It's hidden, and it's quiet. And it slips in, and you gotta look for goodness, and you gotta look for God. But God's worst things in our lives can be stages for signs, wonders, and miracles. And the king of the universe's first bed, now, all you germophobics out there, including my husband and my daughter, how would you like to put your baby in a feeding trough with saliva from creation, saliva from domestic animals, feces? And the stench and the dirt of a stable. And yet God's son, the creator, his first bed was a feeding trough, a manger, a manger. Because God's signs, wonders, and miracles are found in the trouble that comes into our life. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. But don't be afraid because I've overcome the world. Can I have 2 Corinthians 4, 17 up? I haven't shown this scripture. It's been on my notes. Can you put it up? Do you still have it? For our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. <laughs> Trouble is God's stage for signs, wonders, and miracles. Number two, let's look at the shepherds, and then Jim's going to come up and do the wise men. Let's keep reading Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now, they were living in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Let me tell you about shepherds. They were the low man on the totem pole. They were on the graveyard shift. By identification, shepherds, these were probably temple shepherds in my assumption, but Jerusalem was six miles away from Bethlehem. 
And there were lambs for the slaughter daily. And by virtue of their profession, shepherds, they were considered unclean and couldn't go into the temple because by law in Leviticus, if you touched anything dead, anything with blood, or any animal feces, you were ceremonially unclean and you had to go through great rites of purification. This was an agrarian and an arid place and there wasn't a lot of water. So shepherds were unclean. That's why you see in the Old Testament how the Egyptians didn't even want to eat with Israel because they were shepherds and they were considered unclean. So here we see that there's a group of people now, shepherds, abiding, taking care of their flocks by night on the graveyard shift. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What is my point? God uses the weak and the foolish things of this world to absolutely confound the wise. God decided of all the people on the planet that he could bring this message to first. And this message by the angel said to the shepherds, the graveyard, blue-collar, low-class people, behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. That means from every generation until the Lord returns, from generation to generation, every race, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, all people will hear this message that I am bringing to you. You nobodies, you low class, you defiled, you unclean, the ones that nobody knows about, the ones that are on the night shift, the ones that nobody cares about. I'm bringing this message to you. Now, what is God saying in this message? The shepherds. Well, he's saying... 1 Corinthians 1.27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. God's strength is not mediated through greatness but through weakness. God's strength is not mediated through greatness, through the greatness of the flesh, but through the weakness of the flesh. His power is seen. He purposely chooses weak and foolish Lame, unsophisticated, unsuccessful, unlovely, on everything. The graveyard shepherds are the ones that got the message. They're the ones God chose. He puts to shame the things that are mighty and the base things of the world to show the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. God is bringing to nothing the things that are through the things that are not. You're not. I'm not. We're not all that. We're not smart. We're not rich. We're not beautiful. We're not young. We're not educated. We're not great. But God is bringing to naught through the things that are not, that no flesh should glory in his sight. So what is God saying? Number one, trouble is his stage for signs, wonders, and miracles. Two, God uses the weak and the foolish things to confound the wise. He's bringing to nothing the things that are through the things that are not. So just a couple of thoughts about shepherds. And then, Jim, I need you to come up. How about this one? If you're a nothing, like the shepherds, Let's be faithful to our job. God knows where we are. If they hadn't been on the graveyard watch that night, they wouldn't have seen the message, seen the angels or got the message. You in a no-end job, you in a no place, be faithful to it. God knows where you are. How about this one? Don't compare yourselves with others. Eleanor Becker, who's a precious friend of mine and a pastor in this church, taught me this. When we compare ourselves, someone gets smaller, and it's usually us. And God taught me that comparing, complaining, and coveting, wanting what somebody else has, is not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of darkness. So regardless of where you're at, if you'll stop comparing, complaining, or coveting, the kingdom can find you and the miracle can happen. And the last one, you got enemies? The best thing we can do to our enemies is to be successful. Number three, outlast the opposition. Outlast it outlive it, the best thing you can do to our enemy 
is to be successful. Boy, that was a good word. Mama, you did a great job. Thank you. God is so good to us. We're going to continue understanding the nativity scene by just looking at a group of people that oftentimes we look at but we don't really see. I thought it was interesting last week to be able to understand the importance of Mary, but I hadn't heard very many messages in my life about Joseph. And what a great man of God he really is and was. And um, I thought that was fascinating. Well, the same thing can happen today with you, that God wants to speak to you some truths about your life, that when you understand these truths and apply them in your life, it changes your whole world. A lot of people understand, a lot of people listen, but not a lot of people do. And you can listen all you want, and you can understand and make notes, and you can review, and you can get the scriptures and quote them, and until you do it, it doesn't work. It's like the guy that goes to the dentist and says to the dentist, how am I doing? He says, I'm looking at your teeth. Your gums are horrible. You've got to start flossing. If you don't start to floss every day and be serious about it, you're going to lose your teeth. A few years later, he goes back in and starts losing his teeth. Angry about the whole situation, wondering what's going on, the dentist said to him, I told you, you even knew what I said, but you didn't do it. Whose fault is it that he lost his teeth? He heard it, he listened to it, but he didn't do it. And whose fault is that when we don't do what we know to do and we just keep on living life like it's unimportant? This is a message that you're going to hear today about wise men. They are called wise men for a reason. You know why? They're wise. And I don't know about you, but I want to be somebody who not only hears it, but do, does it. And then if I can't do it unless I hear it first. And these are wise men. Don't you want to live your life out wisely? Changing the world that you live in. Don't you want to live that way? You've got one life to live. Wouldn't you say that you ought to live it for God? It's going to come. It's going to go fast. Why not live it for God? And how you live it starts with listening and hearing and then doing like these wise men. I want to take you to Matthew in the second chapter, if I may. Matthew in the second chapter, we're starting in verse number one. Here's the first point, and then I'll read it to you. That makes them wise men that can make you a wise person. Are you ready? The first point is simply this. They went in faith. A wise man doesn't know where he's going, what he's doing, how he's doing it. He just knows that God has spoken. God has described something to us in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 1. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, what, you finish the sentence, not seen. In other words, faith is getting out there, doing something you know God would have you to do. You don't know the results. You don't even know why. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know anything except you've got one commodity for success in your life. God said it. Now let's do it. That's faith. And that takes a lot of guts just to get up and go and do something. These wise men, for an example, were obviously incredibly wealthy and influential people in their realm. Let's talk about wealthy, influential people. Wealthy and influential people like being wealthy and influential. They like the comfort of the wealth. Don't tell me they don't. People listen to them, respect them, honor them, adhere to them, celebrate them. In their homes, because they're wealthy, they have the comforts of whatever the modern day is of that day. They're moved by what people have. They're involved in things by what they have. They are wealthy people. And to stop being wealthy and comfortable and get on the back of a camel for probably three or four months, riding with expensive 
gifts in your possession through land of robbers and thieves and murderers for months after months that would kill you for a little bag of wheat that you might be having on your premises doesn't make much sense at all. Not very many people would do that. Not many people would get out of their comfort zone and go do what God would have them to do without knowing about it, how to do it, which way he wants us to do this, how's it going to work. But that's what faith is all about. Faith is hearing the voice of the Lord, doing what God says, whether it fits your comfort zone, your feelings, your ideologies, philosophies, insights, you know, whether it fits your feelings. We all have plans. Do they not have plans for these months? These are wealthy people bringing wealthy gifts. Let's read about it. First verse, second chapter of Matthew. It says, and now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. You ought to circle in your Bible those words, Herod the king. Herod the king was a murdering madman. A lot of people don't know what a slaughterer he was. He's so insecure about being the king of the Jews himself that when his son even looked like he was going to take over as being the king, did you know he had his own son slaughtered? Did you know when he found his wife maybe conspiring against him to take over, did you know that he had her slaughtered? This man is a murdering madman. And here are these three wise men and they come through town and they make a statement to him. And the statement was an interesting statement, wasn't it? It says now after Jesus was born. You know, a lot of times we see the nativity scene, don't we? We see the shepherds, we see the wise men, we see everybody in attendance. But did you know that really this was after his birth? Probably somewhere Jesus is now about a year and a half to two years old. They, they were not in the manger. That's kind of a surprising thing. I'll show it to you in just a moment. And they went in faith. Well, why wouldn't they expect this King Herod to have heard of the king of the Jews? He's the Messiah. He's the one they've been waiting for. Of course they must know. Yes, he's, he was born a, a year and a half ago up there. And, and here's how you get there. But they don't know that. So Herod comes along and he says, oh, there's a king of the Jews born? And listen, when you find him, tell me where he's at. We want to go and we want to worship him too. Bad men are big liars. And you will always find that a bad man is a big liar. You will always find something horrible in a man like that. He can only wait to find out where the Messiah is born so that he can go and slaughter the Messiah too because he needs to be the king of the Jews. It's more important about him than God having his own will. Can you imagine such a thing? We find something else taking place. Point number one is they went... In faith, that's a bizarre statement. The second thing we can learn from these wise men that help our lives is they gave what they had. Have you ever thought about the gifts that they gave? I mean, they could have given anything. They were obviously very wealthy. Let's read it, if you will. Let's take it from verse number 10. and says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly glad and joy. And when they had come into the what? Not the... Into the what? Not, not, not the manger, but the what? House. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary and his mother. And they fell down and they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Have you ever thought about those gold, frankincense and myrrh? Did you know the gifts that were given to Jesus was describing his Life. Could they have given pearls? Could they have given silver? Could they have given rubies? Or could they have given some other? They gave three things that they brought. How did they know to bring those three things? God had to tell them. Yeah. 
They had to be moved by God, which tells me that God's in the business of controlling righteous men. God, the Bible says, he says the steps of a righteous man is ordered of the Lord. The Bible also says all things are possible to him that believes. The Bible comes along and makes this statement that, that these all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. So therefore, God's in control, and he so controlled these men that they brought three special gifts. Gold, representing his kingship. Frankincense, representing his priestlyhood. Myrrh, representing his death. The whole story of his life was in those three gifts that these wise men brought. Now let me tell you something. If God can move three wise men to bring three special gifts, are you going to tell me that God can't control you to the place where you need to be if you have a willing heart to go in faith to where he tells you to go and do what he tells you to do, like bring the very best gift each and every time to him? Amen. Oh my, he moves on people's life. Third thing we can learn from these wise men that... I think is very important is they're willing to change direction. A lot of times we're set in our own plans. I don't know, for most of us that are in here, especially people that are my age, we are set in stone. We know where we're going. The few years you have left, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. But a wise man is always ready and flexible to be used by God and to have our directions changed by the Lord. Let me tell you what I mean by that because it's important that you understand this. Let me read the verse to you if I may. It says these words, and being divinely warned, verse number 12 in a dream that they should not return to Herod they departed to their own country another way now wait a minute I don't know if you've ever thought about it but think about it circle those two words another way did you know uh, if there's one way that they've come that took three, mo three months for them to get there to go back wouldn't you go back the fastest way I mean, you've been on a camel for three months. You've been traveling for months. You've been doing this for a long period of time. It's really uncomfortable. You now did what you were supposed to do. You delivered the gifts that God told you to give. You worshiped the Messiah. Now it's time. You're finished. It's over with. Let's get home. Our beds are waiting for us. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? You know if you've been in Disneyland all day long, you can hardly wait to get home. But can you imagine being on the back of a camel for months? Hardly wait to get home, but now it comes along, and now they have to go another way because who's waiting for him? Herod. Why? Because he wants to find out where the Messiah is, and if he catches them, he will find out, and he will go in and try to kill the Messiah. So they have to go another way, and another way means this, a way that Herod would never think of. Because Herod said, oh, they didn't go on that road, try this one. They didn't go on that road, try this one. They didn't go on that one. I don't know where they went. They probably went the opposite way home, taking them extra time. Why? Because they're not afraid to put in what's necessary and to have their lives changed. So many times we're so comfortable where we're at, we just won't make the change to go to God. We won't make the change to do what God would have us to do. We won't make the change, man. Here I am, God get involved in it. This is good enough. I'm okay with it. And that's what the world says. That's not what Christians say. Come on, somebody. Today, three things we learn from the wise men. One, they went in faith. That's a bizarre statement. Two, they gave what they had. Each and every time, if you love God, you will give what you have. It's not about what you give. It's about what comes from your heart. What you give never comes from your wallet. Never comes from your checkbook. Always comes from your heart based on who you love most. Third thing, willing to change direction. Willing to follow God. Now you wonder why there's not so many people nowadays that God can use and call them truly wise like this. 
That's the reason why. But now we know so that we can hear, listen, and do. Because here's the point. Without you doing, your teeth are going to fall out. I quit. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> so I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. So let's just talk just for a few moments. I said earlier, this is a divine appointment for you. I've had a lot of appointments. I said earlier, the greatest gift you can give God is you. A lot of times we know who God is. We understand about Jesus. We know about the baby in the manger. But we don't understand about how to get to heaven. And nothing could be worse than you coming into the house of God, hearing the message, singing the songs, getting something from God on this Christmas morning, and walk out of here and be the same. And if your heart stops and you die, here's what I'm telling you and I promise you. You will go to hell. Because you cannot get to heaven. Because you're a good person. Most people think they're going to make it to heaven because they're good. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might as well understand you can't get to heaven because your mom and dad told you were a Christian when you were a kid, had you christened or baptized when you were a baby, get put you through catechism classes or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. Not in the Bible. Won't get you to heaven. Some of you think because you know who Jesus is, somebody came up to you one time in your life and said, do you know who Jesus is? And you said, of course. They said, oh, good, walked away. Like, knowing who he is will get you to heaven. Can I tell you something? It's not what you've done with your head. It's what you've done with your heart that gets you to heaven. You cannot get to heaven your way. You cannot get to heaven my way. And you cannot get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You can't make it any other way but his way. His way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He doesn't leave it up to you. He doesn't leave it up to me. He doesn't leave it up to that group or this group. No, no. He tells you exactly how to get there. Goes to the cross, a beaten, bloody mess. Dies on that cross. Listen to this. Uh, uh, raised from the dead on the third day. Listen to this. Listen to this. Seated at the right hand of the Father so you could go to heaven. And he tells you how to get there. In the scripture. How to get there. Man, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Most people attend American churches don't know what it is. But here's what it is. Jesus says in John, the third chapter... Listen to the words, you must, listen to the words, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born, it's not about you attending church. It's not about your rituals. It's not about this and that stuff you go through. It's about your heart. You must be born again. And who's he say it to? He says it to a guy by the name of Nicodemus in John Third chapter. Why Nicodemus? Why is Nicodemus used in the Bible? Was it just a story? Or can we learn something from Nicodemus? Listen to the words. He comes to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is probably better in his lifestyle than all of us. Why, he's a keeper of the law. Memorized the scripture. Quoted the scripture. Sang the scripture. Preached the scripture. Fed the poor in his community. This Nicodemus is a great guy. Wouldn't you think Jesus would have come to Nicodemus, patted him on the back and said, good job, Nicodemus. You're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. You've done such a great job, Nicodemus. Doesn't say a word about what he's done. Not one single word what he's done. He says these words, you must be born again. That means this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what it means. 
It means you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You got to give him that gift that keeps on giving. The gift of you. All of you. And it's your call and it's your choice whether you do or whether you don't. There's a whole society out there that says no. You know what I say about that? Okay. But us that say yes, we're going to be different. We'll let you be different. Do your thing. But let us do our thing. And we'll serve God with all of our heart and with all of our life. Now listen to me. You have to make the choice. I can't make it for you. God can't make it for you. Do you think that Jesus could have created a trillion robots, maybe two or three trillion robots that all serve God and worship God and sing songs to God and tell him how wonderful he is? Could he have created robots? Yes, but he didn't. He didn't. He gave you a free will choice to make the choice yourself. Will you give him what you have that he wants you to give and paid the price for, which is all of your heart and all of your life. And it's your call. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'm going to count to three like this. I'll go one, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. And when I see your hand go up, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus just in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart and give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I don't want to go to hell. And I want to give Jesus all of my heart and all of my life. Now listen, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I will prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus says these words, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Crude, rude words from Jesus, but truth, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? He really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. That's what he just said. Let me define for you lukewarm. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Jesus is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. You know, he's just something like everything else is something, but he's not everything, and he'll never become something until you make him your everything. Today, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God, lukewarm. And Jesus said he'll vomit you from his mouth. Today you can change the destiny of your existence for eternity by simply giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life, and following up with a passion for him to do things in life his way. Today is your day of salvation. This is your divine appointment. You can sit there and do nothing, or you can get ready to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together, bang, when you hear that sound, you're going to get your hand up and put it right back down. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God? Instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. You've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. You've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. You're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. If you're none of those people that are not sure, make sure today is your day of salvation. Don't miss this opportunity. Those wise men didn't miss being wise because they missed God. They had to get out of their comfort zone and go for God. They had to give God what they had. And the only thing you have is your heart and your life. Man, listen to me now. Today is your day. I'm counting to three. Your call. One. Two, three, 
Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thank you. Back over on this side. Thank you. I think I got you. Fourteen right here. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, to one. Thank you. Back over here. Twenty-two. God bless you. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven right here. Thank you. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Thank you. There's twenty-nine wise people. Where are you? Thirty. You're sitting here saying, I wonder if I should. You should. Where are you? Thirty. Anybody else? Anybody else? Where are you, 30? There's another one somewhere back. They're pointing here. You're pointing there. I don't know where. Just wave at me, 30. I got you, 30 right there. 31, anybody else? 31 up on top. 32 back there. Thank you, family room, 33. In the foyer, ushers, anybody in the foyer? 33, thank God. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 33 white people. Isn't God good? All 33 of you, you said you're going to give God all your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want anybody to leave the room yet. It is rude when you leave. Don't leave early. Hold on. We'll let you go in just a moment. I want all 33 of you, even if you're 34, 35, 36, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, and you know it. You can come too. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Hear me now. Get in the aisle. You come right now and meet me right here in front. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You meet me. Come now, come. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on. And I live for Divine appointment, Every don't miss moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in Divine me. appointment, don't miss Lord, it. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on now. Come on, come on home. Come on home. Every moment I'm away. Thank God, thank God, thank God you've come. Here's what I want you all to do. I want you to look to your left. See this man over here. His name is Dr. Becker. Great guy, Dr. B. Dr. Becker is going to do something wonderful. Three things. Here's what he's going to do. Pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus in. Let him in. He's a gentleman. Won't come in unless you invite him. He, listen, he doesn't come in because you need him. He comes in because you invite him. Because you needed him, he went to the cross, okay? Now invite him in. Second thing he's going to do, now that you're a Christian, what to do next? I mean, like, well, I don't know what to do. Well, these little booklets that they'll give you that's free. I love the word free, don't you? Free tells you what to do next. Third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. These are friends we give away that will meet you before church service, pray for you, help you to get strong in Jesus. Why? Why? So you don't go back doing the old stuff you used to do, but you go on with God. That's what this is all about. I want you to make a left turn. Follow Dr. Becker right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big 